I'm Rod Serling. You're listening to The Zero Hour. Rest your eyes. Exercise your imagination. This week, Adam Hall's chess match of continental intrigue. Queen in danger. Starring Juliet Mills. Robert Brown. And Marie Matheson. In Elliot Lewis's production of The Zero Hour. Mutual Broadcasting System presents The Zero Hour. This is The Zero Hour on Mutual Radio. It is a fact that in people's lives, things do go wrong. An unfortunate event or a personal tragedy of some sort... There's always something external, something unexpected. In a word, trouble. And there are those who thrive on it. Take, for example, Hugo Bishop. Trouble is his business and his pleasure. Maude London is his scene. And trouble is what he's about to find in the persons of Thelma Tasman, known professionally as Gloria Del Rey, Queen Bee of the fashion world, and her husband, Mervyn Spate convicted murderer, declared legally mad, and for the past two years, a full-time tenant in a Broadmoor asylum for the criminally insane, where there has just been a daring escape. Hugo Bishop is in for a rare treat. Mervyn Spade is back in London. Our story, Queen in Danger, will begin... Picture this. London, the first day of spring... The season newly arrived from Paris, overnight and traveling light, to drape green gossamer among skeleton twigs and blow a zephyrous breath against the royal standard high above Buckingham Palace. The queen is at home. Fear has not yet entered the mind of the woman in green, walking briskly along the pathway in St. James Park. She'll be free of fear for another five minutes, perhaps six, but no more. She stops to buy a paper, folds it and tucks it under her arm and walks on. She turns now into Bond Street, and her shadow is cut off suddenly and silently by the high corner buildings. And she's accompanied instead by her glassy reflection in shop windows. Then that too is gone, as she passes the rubble of a bombed site, left abandoned since the Second World War. A grim reminder of how it was. But now, as she steps through the gilt and glass panel entrance of the fashionable Salon des Fleurs, the woman in green moves unsuspectingly among the placid flower bowls in the heavy, perfumed air toward her destined appointment with sudden panic. Good morning, Mrs. Tasman. I'll be with you in just a moment. I have Mrs. Carmody on the phone. Yes, please. I'm in rather a rush. Yes, Mrs. Carmody. I have it down. Tuesday week... Three o'clock. I said Tuesday week, three o'clock. That will be fine, Mrs. Carmody. I'm sorry. I came in to make an appointment, but uh, could you fit me in tomorrow after lunch? Oh, uh, would, would four o'clock be convenient? If I can be out by five. Is it just for your usual face back, Mrs. Desmond? Yes, yes, that's all. Well, you should be away by five then. Thank you. Oh, Mrs. Tasman? Yes? Uh, you left your newspaper. Oh. I turned away toward the ordinary day outside, to the ghost of my reflection in the window. Beyond the glass, the cars and people in the street passed by like figures in a silent film. I felt distracted all the way to my office. I barely noticed the street traffic. I was overwhelmed by feelings of anxiety, 
I don't know what it was exactly. Guilt or fear. Once inside the Miller Group Publishers Building, my sense of panic eased a little. My work was a necessary distraction. But the nameplate on the door to my private office reminded me who I was or wasn't. Gloria Del Rey, fashion editor, Venus Magazine. Nom de plume for Thelma Tasman, which was, in turn, an assumed name. I left word with Glenda, my secretary, to hold all calls. I was summoned by my boss and trusted friend, Maurice Gerald. Come in, Thelma. I just saw the proofs of the Duval layout. It looks worse than I dreamed. No, oh, no, it's a little contrived, that's all. You wouldn't excuse it from anyone else. It would be good from anyone else, except that your standard is higher. Anyway, I didn't call you in about the Duval layout. I didn't think so. How about coming out to stay with us for the week? With Victor going off to Bristol, you're going to be lonely. You've seen the paper. Yes. Mm. It's good of you, Maurice, but I'll manage. Well, Laura would love you to come, and uh, you know how the children feel about you. Laura and I get on well, and I don't want to spoil that. She wouldn't appreciate having your protégé about for a whole week. Now, now, stop thinking of yourself as my protégé. I showed you the ropes, I made you into a fashion writer, but then you took it from there yourself. Now, circulation's gone up a solid 5% since we started carrying the Gloria Del Rey center spread. You gave me a job that required all of my energy and attention when that's just what I needed. I can never thank you enough. So, well, then humor me and come along. I'll phone Laura and let her know. I'd rather not, really. I want to come when it can be a holiday, not an escape. Hmm. You sure? Yes. Give Laura my love. And a slap on the bottom for Mick and Jonathan from their Aunt Thelma. All right, then. But Thelma, take care. The cold black headline in the newspaper would seem to have nothing to do with high fashion Gloria Del Rey or with the woman who called herself Mrs. Victor Tasman. Even Victor, especially Victor would not make any connection between the man mentioned in the newspaper headline and the woman who had become his own common-law wife. Victor had simply accepted my rejection of a formal marriage ceremony. He had no way of knowing I was already married. Married to Mervyn Spate, condemned murderer who was reported today to have escaped from Broadmoor Asylum for the criminally insane. Glenda was out of the office when I returned. It was just as well I needed to be alone. The thought that clouded my mind was, what if Victor should find out? Perhaps I should tell him. Perhaps he was in danger as well as I. I saw it out of the corner of my eye. A small pink page from Glenda's memo pad had blown off the desk onto the carpet. I picked it up. Miss Del Rey. While you were out, a man called. He left no name, but asked for a Mrs... a Mrs. Spade. He seemed quite positive he had the right number. Hugo Bishop here. A trifle on the board side today. But that shouldn't last. It seldom does here in London, you know. Always something irregular going on about. It shan't take me long to find it. Or the reverse. It's a hobby of mine, actually. People in trouble, that is. I share an office with a very regal Siamese cat and a middle-aged, rather conservative woman with an Oxford degree and a talent for embroidery. Mira Gorringe is her name. I prefer to call her Gory. Marvelous woman with a flair for nosing out the fantastic, the incredible, and the macabre. Glory placed the files on my desk as soon as the early edition of the standard hit the street. But I was taking a perverse delight in ignoring them and turned my total attention to cleaning out my favorite meerschaum. That sort of thing should be done in the bathroom. How many times have I told you that? Love me, love my pipe. I should think you'd rather be putting your attention to a bit of business. Such as what? Spate is free. Who? Mervyn Spate, found guilty but insane two years ago at the Central Criminal Court and committed to Broadmoor Asylum. For murder? A woman on a bomb site in Ludgate Hill. Name of Joanna Martin. 
You've been baiting me all along, I suppose. The names of murder victims seem to stick in my mind. But I don't seem to think this means a job for me. An escaped homicidal maniac isn't the least interesting person in the world. I should think you'd like to have a talk with Mervyn Spate. You know where I might find him? No, but if you can't find him, no one can. And there's his wife. She wouldn't make a bad starting point. Gloria Del Rey. Now, that's the second file you placed on my desk. If you want a new study for your personality under stress thesis, she should provide it. I should prefer a graphic summing up to slogging through a folder of your copious notes. With the way you're scattering hot ashes from that smelly monstrosity of yours, it'd be less of a fire hazard at least. <laughs> Anyone tell you, you look a rare treat today, babe. Really, Mr. Bishop, babe is hardly a suitable nomenclature for someone old enough to be your great aunt. Well, very well, Auntie. Give me the dope on Gloria Del Rey, formerly Mrs. Mervyn Spate. Still Mrs. Spate, but now calling herself Mrs. Victor Tasman. A new marriage isn't legal, then? Can't be. She's never divorced Spate. As I recall, Spate was an artist before he took up murder. Thelma met him at art school. At the time of the murder, they'd been married three years. By then, Spate had become a professional painter with something of a reputation. Oh. All smashed to bits in that one moment of violence in Ludgate Hill. Quite. Did Thelma Spate attend her husband's trial? Faithfully. Remaining the loyal wife throughout. Despite the fact that apparently the marriage wasn't a blissful one, Spate had too much temperament for his pretty young wife to handle. Ah. Wherever do you come by your little crumbs of information, Gory? One must learn the language of the sparrows. They sit on every windowsill. Well, I'm more of a raven myself. So, with her husband put behind bars at Broadmoor, what did Thelma Spate do following the trial? Left England for a bit to get away from the notoriety. Lived alone in Italy. And met Victor Tasman. Technical representative of a British-owned aircraft and allied products company. Quite the opposite from the temperamental artistic type. Precisely. And Thelma Spate then returned to England as Thelma Tasman. And became Gloria Del Rey. Thanks to Maurice Gerald. Editor-in-chief of Miller Group Publishing. And how does he fit into the picture? Friend in need, I should say. He first offered his assistance to the stricken young wife during the trial. Then immediately on her return to England came forward with the job of fashion editor. Why did Gerald do this, do you suppose? Plainly felt sorry for her, I imagine. He's known as a generous man. Also, perhaps he sensed she had the makings of a crackerjack fashion writer, since that's what she's turned out to be. This room is 20 feet long and 16 feet wide, with at least a dozen sizable ashtrays strategically placed about. Need I say more? No, but you probably will. <laughs> it appears to me the prime question for conjecture at this point is, does Spate know? Does Spate know what? That Mrs. Spate is now calling herself Mrs. Tasman. Then you're interested... I don't know yet. Well, if you decide you are, you'll find the files quite complete. I frequently bless your morbid curiosity, Gory. It appears Princess Ju Yi Shin would like an audience with you. Ah, send her in. Hello, gorgeous. The Princess Ju Yi Shin paddled silently across the room. The light from the windows glinting in her great blue eyes. With one quick flash of smoky fur, she leapt onto the desk, settled on the haunches beside me, with her tail curled neatly around her chocolate feet. I blew my meerschaum back into life, and the cat and I together watched the curl of smoke with a quiet, idle fascination. And then I brought out the chess set. I sifted the pieces and set them on the board one by one. Thelma Spates, alias Mrs. Victor Tasman, alias Gloria Del Rey. The Queen in Danger. Next to White Rook, near the Queen. Maurice Gerald, the Protector, at an equal distance from the Queen, a White Knight. Victor Tasman, the Constant Lover, behind the Queen, directly behind, but at a greater distance. Mervyn Spates. 
Husband, murderer, madman. The Red King, enrobed in blood, with a red pawn laid beside the king. Joanna Martin, dead by the king's hand, and bloodied too. Huh. What do you think, my beauty? Time to place the sixth piece on the opposite side of the board, away from the others, but facing them. A white bishop, my own namesake, at a standstill and wondering where to begin. There were yellow tulips in a bowl on the table, bright as agony in the sunshine. It seemed astonishing that color so brilliant should cast a shadow of mere gray on the tablecloth. But the shadow was there. Seven gray heads against the blue linen. Gloria Del Rey works too hard. She likes it that way. I know. Victor Tasman should talk, whose job is taking him off to Bristol for a whole bloody week. I have no choice. And uh, the sooner I go, the sooner I should be back. What can I do to compete with a supercharger? What is it, love? Is something troubling you? No. <laughs> Lucky you. Uh, have you seen the papers today? Why? Wh Why, no, I haven't. Is there some reason I should? <laughs> Velma, darling, you, you are tense. All of London will be, I should think. Uh, seems a maniac escaped to Looney Bin. Victor. Victor, I love you. Well, then, for the thousandth time, marry me. Not that today, Victor, please. Let's order lunch, shall we? God save the Queen. I decided to start exploring my interest in the Spate affair by comparing notes with my old chum, Freddy, Detective Inspector Frisnay of the New Scotland Yard. We met at one of my favorite spots, which wasn't one of Freddy's. A milk bar at the bottom of Charing Cross Road. You'd better find Spade quickly, don't you think, Freddy? I mean, the bloke might go and pop someone else off just to celebrate being on the outside. Then where would you be? Anyway, it'd be preferable to hear sitting with Hugo Bishop contemplating a milkshake. What are you having? Oh, I rather fancy a strawberry shake and a ham sandwich. Seeing it'll come out of your expenses. I'm off duty. Oh, I hate to contradict you. But we're going to talk business. Whose? Yours. Don't you ever talk about your own. I haven't any of my own. My business is everybody else's. You're all right. Only anything but space. I've had enough of him for one day. Well, where are you looking for him? No statement. Very well, we won't talk about space. We'll talk about Mrs. Space. She's out of town. Out of town. We checked her address. What address? 19 Stapleton Crescent. Spate's been sending letters to her there ever since he's been in the asylum. Well, we checked it out, but the woman who lives there is out of town. <laughs> Eve Jordan is out of town. Thelma Spate isn't. Come again. Eve Jordan lives at 19 Stapleton Crescent. She's Thelma Spate's best friend. Thelma used Eve's address for Spate's letters. Why? Why would you feel comfortable about a husband who was a convicted murderer and judged mad to boot? You think Spate's escape puts his wife in danger? Well, she evidently thinks so. That should be enough. Tell me, Hugo, where do you come by all your information? I live in close proximity to a sparrow. Where would we find Thelma Spate, then? Hugo? Mm. That shape is making my mouth water. Oh, it's like something you'd shave with, if you ask me. I don't see why all this electricity and chrome and chemical flavoring have to do with a simple, rustic cow. Look at me, a good old timber-built, worm-eaten, honest-to-God pub any time. <laughs> you don't have to stay and humor me, Freddy. Go and have your beer if you'd like. Oh, all right, Hugo. You win. A ham sandwich and a strawberry shake on the yard. Thank you, Freddy. That's very kind of you. And now, let's have it. Where can we find Mrs. Mervyn Spate? The 
yard would assign a man to Thelma Spate in the hope that she was the lure that would inevitably put Mervyn Spate back in the trap. Freddie and I parted company outside the milk bar and I walked up toward Trafalgar Square. Dusk had fallen. A news vendor hawked papers on the corner. Maniac murderer at large. London at night. Where was Mervyn Spate this moment, I wondered. I thought over Scotland Yard's proposed strategy. This extremely risky business, exposing your queen that way. Lose her, and the match is all but lost. And this is no ordinary game. All possibilities must be weighed and measured. Thelma Spate Tasman is in a most precarious position. One false move could mean the game. And we are playing with her life. <laughs> Tomorrow at this time, rest your eyes and listen here to this week's continuing study in suspense, Queen in Danger. I'm Rod Serling, and this is The Zero Hour. There are detectives, and there are detectives. And then there's Hugo Bishop, connoisseur of crime. Item, maniac murder at large. Mervyn Spate, convicted killer, has escaped from Broadmoor Asylum for the criminally insane. The preceding news brief was brought to Hugo Bishop's attention by his bird-like secretary and confidant, Vera Gorringe. That and the plight of Gloria Del Rey, renowned beauty editor of Venus Magazine. In private life, she is Thelma Tasman, common-law wife of industrial engineer Victor Tasman, who is currently away on business. Her employer... Publishing mogul Maurice Gerald, too, is out of town, leaving this woman of many names alone in London and terrified by her own identity. The fact is, she has still another name. Spate. Mrs. Mervyn Spate. Queen in danger will continue... It was the first of the week's fashion shows I was scheduled to cover. I was alone, except for the jostling crowd around me, dividing their attention between the show about to begin in the main salon and the table bar set up here in the ante room. Hello, beautiful. Rex. You sound glad to see me. I am. Built for the soccer field as you are, you can probably manage to make your way through this mob to get me a sherry. Any little service I can render, though. Be right back. <laughs> Willis was London's favorite fashion photographer. He was also a rat, a rake, a roué. I wouldn't rely on him for my life any more than I would thin ice. But he was big, with magnificent shoulders and a cheerful grin, and just the sort of company I needed at the moment. Here you go, love. Thank you, Rex. That's just what I needed. Oh, for a moment, I relished the thought that I was just what you needed. You are, but not quite in the way you're thinking. What's wrong, beautiful? You look a bit down under. Victor's gone away on business for a week. Yeah. I wonder if I'll ever meet a girl who'll be miserable when I leave her for a week. You wouldn't be interested in one like that. <sighs> You're right there, love. So, oh, shall we? Looks like post time for the show horses. Nice. Music. And on with the show. Number one. Dress in Mediterranean blue by Jacques de Bois. Note the loose three quarter length sleeves designed for coolness on all occasions and the softly draped neckline eternally feminine. Neat little filly red and pretty footwork. I feel Rex's solid masculine presence beside me and somehow I'm safe. Safe for now. Shoes made beautifully to match by Norman Lane and the Give us a little hat by Michaelson. Later tonight, if I feel really afraid, I can telephone Victor. Just the sound of his voice over the phone will comfort me. Or I can spend the evening with Rex. He'll dine me if I ask him, and I could deal with the inference he'd draw from it later. For that matter, I needn't stay at my place at all this week. 
I could rent a room at some small hotel while Victor was away. Somewhere across the city, far away from the flat where Mervyn would never find me. Rex is flashing me his best grin, and I can manage a smile back. I needn't really be afraid. Of that, I'm convinced. But still, I am afraid. I am. <laughs> Tasman flat, where Thelma Spate lived out her new alliance with Victor Tasman, was round the corner from Queen Street in Thames Gardens. When I walked by there to take a look, I found my Scotland Yard confederate, Freddie Frisnay, checking with his man on the job. No sign of Spate or Mrs. Either up to now. Are you going to talk to her when she shows? No. Why not? Well, she could be ready to aid and abet him, you know. Uh, not as I see his reason it out, Freddie. She goes abroad after the trial and comes back with a man who's her new husband, except for that little detail of the ceremony. Doesn't sound to me like she's ready to give a spade a hand. More likely, she's worried what he's ready to give her. Well, we can keep just as good a watch her without knocking on her door. And she hasn't knocked on yours yet. What do you mean? She hasn't asked for any police protection. No, which shoots your theory. Spade got himself out of Broadmoor for some reason. If he found out his wife was living with another man seems a good one to me, and I'm sane. You wouldn't care to submit to a test of that fact, would you? <laughs> Freddy, my boy, as a matter of fact, I've just gotten a sudden crazy idea. Do you want to share it? Well, uh, not till I see if it works. Just have to make a quick call to be sure my little sparrow is home on the nest. <laughs> Did you send it? Yes, it's there by now. Do you mind staying in case there's a call? I wouldn't miss it. This was my case to begin with, you know. Uh, I know. But I gather it's caught your interest. Mm, a bit. At any rate, I've just gotten a notion, and it might keep me most of the night. Dangerous, Mr. Bishop? Oh, uh, yes. A slight risk of varicose veins. Ta-ta, Auntie. It turned out I had to go back to my own flat. Rex, it seemed, engaged a sylph-like model for the evening's recreation. So I took a taxi home to face my fear alone. What was my fear, exactly? It seemed I also had to name it. Mervyn had learned about Victor and me. He had managed to escape from Broadmoor for one reason, to kill me. Strangle me with that same hideous strength that had snuffed out the life of the woman on the bomb site in Ludgate Hill. But it wasn't the man I feared, or even death. It was the madness, the fear of encountering a deranged mind. And if that wasn't enough, I got into it with the cabbie, and he absolutely refused to take me to my door. He left me at the corner. turned up the steps to the entrance of the flat, I became acutely aware of the presence of a man in the shadows of the doorway across the street. The flesh at the nape of my neck falls. I quickened my step, hurried inside and closed the outer door. A moment later, I was inside my apartment, flattened against the door in the dark, frightened of what I might see if I turned on the light. Then the toe of my shoe touched something on the floor and I reached for the light switch. In the glow of the ceiling lamp, I saw the envelope, mute and white against the royal blue of the carpet. Three words were written boldly across the front of it. Mrs. Victor Tasman. A threatening note from Mervyn. That was all I could think of, although the handwriting on the envelope was unfamiliar. I slit the envelope open with my finger and took out the note. It was brief. All it said was, If you need help... Telephone C-A-R-2330. Ask for Bishop. The flower grew against the sky. 
black petal with a stem as thick as a tornado's rope from where I viewed it in my cramped position against the broken wall. Somewhere here, among the rubble and the creeping tapestry of weeds, Joanna Martin had been found with the life throttled from her body and her blood congealed on a slab of stone that her skull had split against. And they had found Spate, too, lying in the half-choked cellar below the woman's body, still unconscious from his crashing fall. Twice since I'd come, the monotony of waiting and the strain of cramped leg muscles had nearly caused me to give up. I knew that my chances of success were worse than poor. But then, the thought would repeat itself in my mind. The thought that had brought me here to this infamous bomb site, Luckett Hill. It was a tide old saw, but nonetheless true. Often, a murderer did return to the scene of his crime. Is that you? Thelma! Uh, what's wrong? Nothing, darling. I, I'm sorry it's so late. It's only twelve. You sound uh, odd. What is it? No, Victor. Everything is all right. I just wanted to hear your voice and say good night. I'm glad. Actually, I, I meant to phone you, but uh, I've been talking my head off steadily for hours, trying to fix a deal. Any luck, darling? Uh, not really sure. But uh, never mind about business. I miss you, my love. I caught myself only half listening. My eyes were focused on the door to the flat, and I was imagining Mervyn walking up to it, his hand on the knob, his brute strength forcing it open. Darling? I miss you too, Victor. Terribly. There is something wrong. I'm lonely for you, that's all. Please don't be away any longer than you have to. You know, I really... Your three minutes are up. Operator, this is a private call. I'm sorry. You booked three minutes. Uh, shall I extend it? Yes. No. Good night, Victor. Hurry back. I'll telephone you in the morning, darling. Uh, get a good night's sleep. Victor, I'm... I found myself staring at the door. I don't know how long I sat there. I was not aware when my mind crossed the border dividing reason from obsession, from control to submission, plunging me into a wilderness of terror. It was no longer possible for me to believe that Mervyn would not come, or when he came, that he could not get in. I stared at the door and saw the knob turn, the door open, and Mervyn standing there, his eyes bright with unreason, his shabby figure slack, his hands hanging loose until he lifted them and came toward me. Perhaps mute stones are infused with memory like an unseen stain. Or else I was only diverting myself from the boredom of my vigil. In any event, I found my mind absorbed with the images of that night two years ago when Joanna Martin was slain. I saw the movement of her dress as she fled across the weeds through masonry, her stricken face as she turned back toward the man who picked his way through the rubble, moving to her with strong arms outstretched, eyes glinting with madness. The fierce look of fingers upon flesh, the violent squeezing out of the last vital breath of air. Of air, poor girl. Poor unfortunate madman. The vigil had made me morbid. The stones against my back had left me cold. And again I thought of giving up, leaving this place to its own brooding memories. I moved to ease the cramp in my legs and lifted my face to where the stars roofed the jagged gap between the broken walls. And there he was. A dark, hulking shape against the night sky. Staring down at me with eyes void of all expression. Beyond the shadow of a doubt, it was Mervyn Spade. I remembered Gory's question on the telephone. Dangerous, Mr. Bishop. And now it was... 
I had crouched against this wall for more than two hours. My legs and back were cramped. My position, alone, had me at a disadvantage. Spade was standing almost directly over me. And he had already murdered once. He had little to lose by killing again. Who are you? The name is Bishop. Police detective? No. What are you doing here? I was waiting. Waiting for you. You knew I would come here. No. But I thought it was possible. This waste of bricks has been the most important place in your whole life. If you're not a policeman, what is your interest in me? Humanity interests me. You want to observe the lunatic mind at work. You think I'm mad. But I'm not. What's it like for you inside Broadmoor? I have smokes, if that's what you're wondering. I'm on the block for privileged patients now. I, I can even shave with a razor. <laughs> But you're still locked up. You can never see farther than the trees. Even when you know and remember and think about everything that's outside, all the all the people and things you used to know and love. How do you spend your time in there? They let me have paper and pencil. I make sketches. Sketches. I can eat. Spade abruptly tossed a small pad of paper down to me. I leaped through it. They were all sketches of a man's face. A face expressing violent hate and fear. The fine drawn lines of the eyes and mouth conveyed a strain that transformed it into a face of abstract evil. I wondered if Spate meant it as a self-portrait. Do you know that face? It's the face of madness. Why do you spend all your time sketching only that? I don't want to forget it. And it's not meant as a self-portrait. I told you I'm not mad. Why did you break out of Broadmoor space? Because you wanted to see beyond the trees. Give me back the sketches. Oh, here are space. You still think I'm there? He turned away then. And in a moment, his dark, brooding form was no longer silhouetted against the sky. If... if I tried... I might follow and overpower him from behind. Or I could notify Freddy, the yard, his whereabouts. I did neither. At this point, I chose to let Spade go free. I don't know when the phone stopped ringing or when I stopped screaming. I was still sitting by the phone, staring at the door, paralyzed by fear when suddenly... It's Bridget, Mrs. Tassel. Let me in. It's all right, Mrs. Tassel. I'm here to help you. But how did you know you, you I needed... You called my number. You talked to my associate, Mrs. Gorringe. I don't remember. She told me you were very upset, very frightened. I thought perhaps Spade had come here. I thought he had. I must have only imagined it. Yes. Fear can play strange tricks. I must have remembered your note. Uh, yes. That was why I sent it. But I don't understand. Who are you? Why would you want to help me? I... I want to help people in trouble for the opportunity it gives me of seeing life through other people's minds. You take a morbid interest in personal tragedy. Yes, interest. Morbid, no. Academic and constructive, I suppose. For two pins, you'd throw me out. Now that I've told you how I tick... I think you're a strange man, Mr. Bishop, but I'm grateful for your offer of help for whatever your reason. 
When I called your number, I was in a state of shock. The mere ringing of my phone had sent me into hysterics. You thought it was your husband, uh, that is, Mervyn Spate. It's true, you've never divorced Spate. Yes. Somehow I couldn't. After he was sent away to the asylum, it seemed he needed me more than when we were together. Well, I doubt it was Spate calling you tonight. It would have been about the time I was with him. You've seen Mervyn? I waited on the barn site in Luggett Hill. He came there as I thought he might. How was he? I mean, how did he act? As you would expect a hunted man to act. Did he say anything? He insisted he wasn't insane. He kept insisting that all through the trial. Well, criminals are always insisting they're innocent. Did he say anything else? Well, I asked him why he had broken out of Broadmoor. But he... He didn't answer. I can tell you why, Mr. Bishop. There can be only one reason to kill me. Tomorrow at this time, rest your eyes and listen here to this week's continuing study in suspense, Queen in Danger. I'm Rod Serling, and this is The Zero Hour. Rarely does one find a detective in the social register. Hugo Bishop, London super sleuth, is an exception. He's a whippet-like, non-violent man. With a penchant for chess, he prefers milkshakes to ale and has a reputation for being in the right place at the right time. This should lend solace to the overwrought Thelma Tasman. Hugo Bishop is on her case. The case of her husband, actually. Convicted killer Mervyn Spate, who recently escaped from Broadmoor Asylum for the criminally insane. The fact is, Thelma finds Bishop's unorthodox methods disquieting. Nevertheless, Hugo and his intuitive secretary, Vera Gorange, press on. Staying close to Thelma Tasman are publisher Maurice Gerald, her employer and steadfast friend. Fashion photographer Rex Willison, a volunteer male companion... Freddie Frisney of Scotland Yard, and, of course, Hugo Bishop. Oddly, Thelma's common-law husband, Victor Tasman, is out of town. Hugo Bishop has never met the man, but would like to. He'd like to look him in the eye to see if there's a resemblance to a series of sketches he's been shown by Mervyn Spate, because Hugo Bishop is convinced that Mervyn Spate is innocent, and the man portrayed in the sketches is not Queen in Danger continues. What was Mervyn waiting for, I wondered. I knew he had learned of my identity as Gloria Del Rey and my address as Mrs. Victor Tasman. I was certain he meant to kill me as he had killed Joanna Martin. Was he waiting for Victor to return? or waiting only to torture me. If that was his intention, it was working. The longer he waited, the more my terror grew. Yes, miss? He was a small, thin man, bald as a billiard ball. His nose was hooked, as if years of sniffing at articles brought to him for sale had caused it to turn under. His shoulders were slightly humped, their blades visible beneath his old sweater, making him look like a bird of prey with its large wings folded. He leaned forward in the dim light, assuming the posture of a vulture among the littered display of cast-off clothing, kit bags, golf clubs, cameras, binoculars, violins and guitars, and guns. Can I do something for you? There's something in your window. <laughs> oh, there's many things. The little black gun. Oh, yes, I I thought perhaps. In my business, you guess so you can tell. I'll get it for you. There it is, miss. It's small, it's light. Just right for a young woman such as yourself. Have you suitable ammunition? Well, I may have. Yes, I may have. But, uh, have you a license? No, It's but... not always easy to get a license, you know. 
Well, most have a reason for carrying a gun. They always ask. I shall be able to satisfy them. How much is the gun? Well, with the clips of ammunition I think I could find, uh, the gun will be 12 pounds. I haven't that amount with me. I will accept your check, miss. I don't accept checks as a rule, but I will accept yours. I prefer to pay cash. I have about 10 pounds with me. It's the perfect little weapon for you. I say, would it be possible for you to bring the additional two pounds in later? No. I shan't be this way again. Uh, well, well, then I suppose... Uh, oh, very well, miss. I, I won't neglect my chance of doing you a service. And the ammunition? Oh, yes, yes, here you are. Thank you. My shop is so dusty and dark. Few young ladies as beautiful as you come into it. You bring it life. You take away death. I paid the ten pounds, dropped the gun into my handbag and walked briskly out of the dark little shop, away from the little voucher man. I stepped out onto the sidewalk, back into the bright afternoon sun and ran straight into the ubiquitous Hugo Bishop. Well, hello. Did you follow me here, Mr. Bishop? I might ask you the same. Did you follow me? Sorry. I suppose that was an odd thing to think. Well, quite understandable. That is, as understandable as any coincidence can be. I'm merely waiting for the garage across the way to check the oil in my car, and you're simply doing some shopping. Yes, of course. The only coincidence is that my garage and your shop happen to be opposite. I was whiling away my time. In fact, staring into that extraordinary pawn shop window must contain everything in the world. I'm afraid you'll have to excuse me, Mr. Bishop. I have still another show to cover. Well, let me run you over there. You'll have finished my car by now. It actually isn't far. Ah. Well, then you'll be in good time. Come along. What is it, Mr. Bishop? You seem different now than last night when you came to help me? Different? How? Well, you were very kind. You offered just what I needed, a sort of quiet strength. That's me. I'm the archetype of a strong and silent man. You would be if you didn't try to be so facetious. Me facetious, Mrs. Tasman. Very well. I'll be serious, if you'd like. Who are you trying to shield? I don't understand. Are you trying to shield Victor Tasman? Or Maurice Gerald? Or Rex Willison? Or someone whose name I don't know? Someone called the Gent. I watched her face as I asked my question naming the men around her. But she only looked bewildered. That, perhaps, was my answer. Now she sat quietly beside me as I drove her to the next show. I've been trying to understand what you meant. What would I be trying to shield them from? Hanging. Hanging? Victor, Maurice, Rex. Thelma, there is the theory being considered now that your husband, Mervyn Spate, might truly be innocent. Not been innocent. But he's been proven mad. Yes. And that has become your obsession. I lived with Mervyn. I saw his terrible temper. That doesn't mean he's done murder. But if he didn't... Someone else did. Someone close to you, I should think. Someone you might be trying to protect because he means more to you than Mervyn Spate. But I believe Mervyn did it. I believe he's mad. Yes. I rather think you do. And perhaps you're right. But Mervyn believes he's innocent and sane. And that perhaps you're shielding the real murderer. Poor mad Mervyn. Before our marriage was a year old, we'd stopped loving each other. And I'd begun to be afraid. Afraid of his unreasonable rages. And now you fear his madness? Yes. Here we are. Park Court. Thank you again, Mr. Bishop. Where will you be going after this show you're covering? There's a cocktail bash at the Lotus Bowl. Are the gates crashable? Will you come? I just might. With a guest, if I may. Of course. Who is it? Lady Farisham. A dear old thing I picked up at the garden fest. You'd adore her. 
Though I should warn you of one thing. What's that? She's a bit nervous. So so do be careful not to let anything go off in your handbag. I thought about Thelma buying the gun and wondered why. To defend herself if Spate showed up. Her obsession might have driven her to that point. I had no way of knowing if she bought the thing by plan or by impulse. I found Freddy Frisnay wrestling with the same knobby issue. What do you make of the Tasman woman? In light of a new role. You mean now that she's toting a rod? Precisely. <laughs> Freddy. <laughs> so your man was shopping with her, was he? Of course. He had more trouble keeping out of your way than hers. He shouldn't be so sensitive. I wouldn't bite him. Freddy, why do you think she's bought a gun? To shoot someone with. Hmm. A couple of rare sleuths we are. By the by, Freddy, my man. I am not your man. Oh, Freddy, just a figure of speech, old boy. Have you any records at the yard on a bloke called the Jet? Several. It's not uncommon, you know. Any hoodlum who sports a Woolworth's tie pin gets the name. Well, check the lot. The one I'm interested in was described as a tough uh, businessman sort. Had a car, middle-aged, a big man. Mm -hmm. That narrows it. We'll check. Is he someone who might have been involved with Joanna Martin? Yes. A lot of blokes were, apparently. And while you're at it, you might also check uh, an Emerson, little man with glasses. Had a car, some money, and um, a Sydney, a flash type, smoked cigars, wore rings. Cocky little rat. Why didn't you put me onto these characters over our lunch? You weren't inclined to consider anyone else but Spade at that point, as I recall. Don't misread me, Hugo. I'm still not. That is not officially. <laughs> Good old cautious Freddy. I'll follow your leads and keep in touch. Now, don't push me. Cocktail to the Lotus Bowl. I'm agreeable, but what are we doing? Just keeping our fingers in the pie. Who am I supposed to be at this bash, did you say? Lady Varisham, the dear old baggage I picked up at a horse fair. The name is reasonable. I dislike the description. Hmm. Well, how about a bit of fluff I picked up at a carpet sale? In any event, an English eccentric of some 60 summers who's a nut on fashion. That's the birdie. Lorniette, jet locket, dodo feather fan, and tweed galoshes. Sounds like fun. <laughs> I'll go to work on it. And of course, uh, one thing to keep in mind this evening. What's that? The Queen is packing a gas. When Gory returned, she was dressed to the nines for her party role as Lady Verisham. Expensive basic black cultured pearls and her blue rinse piled high in an elegant upsweep. The old baggage from the horse fair has arrived. <laughs> Pardon, madame. Well? Oh. Is this Bishop? It is. This is Mervyn Spate. <laughs> wanted to talk to me. We arranged the meeting place. It meant we both would have to shinny our way through the police and Scotland Yard dragnet. It also meant that Gory and I would have to forego our cocktail date with Thelma Tasman and company at the Lotus Bowl. My rendezvous with Spate seemed more important. And now I had something more urgent for Gory to do as well. I gave her a list of names. There were people I wanted to have on deck later tonight if the plan I had in mind took shape. Lovely. I always get gutted up in my best basic black and pearls to spend the evening on the telephone. <laughs> Don't worry. Lady Barisham may have her hour of glory yet. Where are you meeting Spate? Oh, round. Cagey. Reasons? Dangerous? Depends. Is Spate a lunatic killer, or isn't he? I don't think you should go without telling me where to look for your body. With the police all around Spade as they are, they'll find my remains PDQ. So you don't have to worry your beautiful blue rinse about that. Some consolation you're leaving me with. Ah, oh, no, no, no. Gory girl, don't go sentimental on me. Now, you get on the blower, and I'll see you later. With luck. I found Spate waiting on the embankment of the Thames between Vauxhall Bridge and the Chelsea Bridge, crouched beside the dark water, Chilled and cramped, hungry and exhausted. Speed. 
It's me, Bishop. I wasn't sure you'd come. I said I would. I brought you some food. But you better eat it slowly. Oh, thank you, thank you. The police are moving across this whole area. They'll be coming down here by land and by water. I know. I know, no, no. They nearly had me twice. You said you wanted to talk. We don't have long. Last time we met, I got the feeling you might help me. I think I have been. Provided you didn't actually murder Joanna Martin. Oh, dear God. I thought there was only one other man living who could consider I didn't do it. The man who did. And you didn't kill the girl, Spade. At my trial, I got tired of saying no, no. Sometimes at the asylum, I said I did. It never seemed to matter much which I said. You really want to know? I do. No, I did not kill her. You saw the man who did? I saw him. The man in your sketches? Yes. Can I see them again? Very well. I'll have to wait until we get close to where the light is better. We? I want you to come with me, Spade. Come with you? Where? Where we can get you some rest. If I stay here, they'll get me. I may as well come with you. But look here. You cross me, Bishop, and so help me. I'll kill you. Kill me? Nearly everybody says I'm a murderer, don't they? There's something you should know, Spade. If the real murderer has gotten himself close to your wife for his own reasons, she doesn't know it. Are you sure of that? Quite sure. Come on. Better get out of here. Wait, Bishop. You're taking a chance doing this. Tell me why. Don't try to figure me out, Spade. There isn't time. Hugo Bishop had made such a point of planning to gatecrash the cocktail party at the Lotus Bowl. Why hadn't he shown up, I wondered. There'd been no sign of him. Or Lady Verisham, whoever she might be. Again, as I lost the protection of the crowd around me and was faced with another night of lonely panic, I sought the comforting male companionship of Rex Wilson. What is it, Thelma? You've been edgy all evening. I expected someone tonight who didn't come, that's all. <laughs> Will you have dined, you love? I like your company, Rex. Great. I've always wanted a kid sister. Poor boy. When a woman doesn't want you for your rippling torso, you just get lost in the forest, don't you? That's Gloria Del Rey and her fashion talk. And you'd rather have fashion talk. Oh, just because I asked you to my flat doesn't mean I wanted to show you my etchings. Uh, you said something about dreading another night alone. I said that? You did, love. I'm sorry. It only means I miss Victor. Yeah, of course. But he's away and I'm here. And you've been just what I needed. You told me three genuinely funny stories and gave me a marvelous dinner. And now you're going to see me safely home. I am? Oh. Yes, uh, I suppose I am. But as soon as Rex had seen me inside my door and left me alone as I asked him to, I was sorry I'd sent him away. Sorry I hadn't gone to his flat. I could have dealt with him. Anything would be better than my renewed feeling of panic. I tried telephoning Rex, but there was no answer. Victor. I had to hear the sound of Victor's voice again. Bristol Motel. Mr. Victor Tasman, please. I'm sorry, Mr. Tasman has checked out. Checked out? Are you sure? Just a moment, I'll make certain. Yes, Mr. Tasman left at 8 o'clock, just over an hour ago. Uh, did he say where he was going? No, I'm sorry, he did not. I see. Thank you. office. This is Thelma Tasman. Is Mr. Bishop there? No, I'm sorry, Mrs. Tasman. He's not just now. Well, tell him I called, will you? Oh, Mrs. Tasman. He'll want to know where he can reach you later. What shall I tell him? Tell him... Tell him I'll call back. I was afraid to leave, but even more afraid to stay. I decided to spend the night at a hotel somewhere on the other side of the city. 
I phoned for a taxi, gathered up my wrap and handbag, and cautiously opened the door. Then I remembered the gun. I had taken it out to load it and placed it in the drawer of my bedside table. I hurried back to get it. Then I remembered I had left the door to my apartment open. I heard the sound of the lift gates at the other end of the passage. Did I really hear it, or was it in my imagination? But now, there were muffled footsteps coming down the passage toward my door. I mustn't see him. I couldn't stand the sight of his face, his killer hands, his eyes that were mad. My fingers closed around the gun. I heard the small click of the safety catch as I released it. His footsteps drew closer. Slowly, quietly. Then, suddenly, the stream of light was broken by the dark shadow of his silhouette, and the gun in my hand went off. Tomorrow at this time, rest your eyes and listen here to this week's continuing study in suspense, Queen in Danger. I'm Rod Serling. And this is The Zero Hour. London's Hugo Bishop, eccentric connoisseur of crime, would be the first to admit that he is not infallible. However, he'd be quick to add that he is seldom wrong. And he is now preparing to administer the acid test for a course in murder. Who was the real killer at Ludgate Hill? The obvious answer is Mervyn Spate. The man was convicted. But Hugo Bishop hasn't time for the obvious. Nor has Thalma Tasman. Nor, for that matter, has Mervyn Spate. With Scotland Yard's dragnet closing in, his time is running out. Hugo Bishop's test has but one question. It's multiple choice. The real murderer is A. Victor Tasman, Thalma's common-law husband. B. Maurice Gerald, her friend and employer. Or C. Rex Willison, fashion photographer and willing companion. Everyone ready? Pencil sharpened? The conclusion of Queen in Danger. I was certain that it was Mervyn, come at last, and he had come to kill me. I pointed the gun and squeezed the trigger. It kicked in my hand. I was holding it so tightly, I don't know how many times I fired... But the dark shadow of the man didn't crumple to the floor in a pool of blood as I expected. Instead, it moved into the room and came toward me. And I saw that it wasn't Mervyn at all. It was Rex Willison. It's all right, love. You missed. He reached out for the gun and I dropped it limply into his hand. He eased me into a chair and I saw him drop the weapon into his pocket as a policeman came to the door, followed by a couple of my more curious neighbours. Aye, what's up, mister? What were their shots all about? Shots? I, I didn't hear any shots. Oh, come off it, mister. We heard them plain enough, didn't we, Herbert? Three of them. Bam, 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 not that. Right, Herbert? Oh, oh that, 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 that wasn't shooting. The, the ice tray was jammed in the fridge. I was breaking it free with a hammer. Uh, I guess you'll have to charge me with a breach of the peace, officer. Glad to know that's all it was. All right, people. Let's all get back to our own flats, shall we? Sorry, officer. Didn't know I was waking the dead. People are too curious for their own good sometimes. Not as good to know you boys are on the job. Uh, we're on a bloody job, all right. Extra hours these days. Well, good night, then. Good night, officer. <sighs> He's gone. Luckily, he didn't see the slugs in the doorpost. <laughs> You're a rotten shot, love. Oh, Rex, I'm sorry. I... Th I know what you thought. You thought I was he. You've had the hebes ever since he broke out. Then you know who I am. Well, I've heard it all along. I covered the Joanna Martin murder for one of the newspaper syndicates. And you haven't told anyone? About me, I mean. Oh, you know me, love. I'm not much of a talker. Oh, Rex. But I must say I don't think the gun is a good idea. May I have it back? If you don't mind, I think I'd better keep it for you. Mervyn Spate sat rigidly at my side, 
as I guided my ancient Rolls Royce directly through the heart of the police dragnet. Hang on. You'll soon be roses the rest of the way. <laughs> Everybody I see looks like a cop. A jolly well could be. Oh, oh, oh. That one is for sure. An old friend of mine from the yard. A bit gullible, I must say. He spotted my car. You stay put. I'll handle him. Good evening, Freddy. You look a bit fat. This isn't exactly fun and games, Hugo. You have anything for me? Oh, yes, 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 old boy. I've got space in my car. Did you want him? Uh, correction, this is fun and games to you, I suppose. As a matter of fact, I'm thinking of throwing a party later tonight. An informal little spree at the Rothbury Club. Enjoy yourself. Looking about midnight. You might find it interesting. Not as interesting as I expect to find my bed at that hour. You can come officially, Freddy. Bring all the boys. Drinks on me. Spade will be there. Hugo, are you on the level? You know me, chump. Now I must be going. I have someone with me. See you about uh, 12. Spate and I made it the rest of the way through the police blockade without a hitch. Three minutes after, we were safely in my digs. Spate was sound asleep. Gory reported to me that she had managed to contact everyone I'd asked her to, making up the most interesting guest list any party ever had going for it. While we waited, I tried to engage Gory in our continuing chess match. But as usual, she couldn't keep her mind on the game. There is the chance that nothing will come off at this party, isn't there? Perhaps. But I believe our person, the man in Spate Sketches, is among those on the guest list. And if he shows, and I believe he will, our party is bound to be a smashing success. A reunion, I should think. Our person hasn't seen Mervyn Spate since that fateful night at Ludgate Hill. Do I understand you to say, Hugo, that Spate will be attending the party? You understand me perfectly, Gory Girl. Mervyn Spate is to be the guest of honor. I went into the next room to rouse Spate. Wasn't easy. He'd gotten only an hour's rest, and I knew he needed more. But it couldn't be helped. It was now or never. A cold shower, a shave, black coffee, and a set of clean clothes brought him round. He was standing before the mirror, looping his tie into a full Windsor. His eyes were bloodshot from fatigue, but they were wide open, brimming with anticipation. Are you ready for this, Spate? I've been ready for a long time. Now don't blow your cool, chum. If you see him, don't do anything. Leave that to me. I... I don't know. After two long years where I've been... Now, I... just promise me you won't do anything rash. Mr. Bishop... I appreciate all you've done for me, but I must tell you one thing. I am a man of my word. And if I see that face tonight, the evil face that burned into my memory, I cannot promise you anything. We drove through the dark London streets. It was a rough night for the boys. All over town there were splits, buzzies, dicks, bogies, flatties, the hot lot and the heavy mob. You couldn't put your mug outside the door without getting a flash lamp on it. Even the river was hot. But in the ballrooms, the nightclubs and late supper establishments, no one was worried by the police hunt that spread like a net over the city. They danced, ate, drank and were merry. In the Rothbury Club, there were perhaps 50 people jammed between the snack counter, the two bars, and the tiny bandstand. The word had got round, Hugo Bishop was giving a party. No one knew why I was giving a party, but that wasn't important. It was a good party, and these days, good parties were hard to come by. In a way, it was a surprise party, and I adore surprises. I squeezed through the crowd to one of the bars. Hello, Mr. Bishop. What ruddy good party. You know, I've never been to one like this. Good of you to come, Mrs. Martin. I never tasted gin like this before, neither. No, I don't imagine you ever have. Uh, sit slowly. I don't want you to miss anything. I looked around the room. Helmut Tasman was just arriving. She was accompanied by her employer, Maurice Gerald. 
They were both impeccably dressed and made a rather handsome couple. The queen looked majestic as always. The white knight, number one. I wondered, could Maurice Gerald be the man in the sketches? Spate would know, and so would I in due time. But there were others to consider. Rex Willison, for one. I spotted him in the crowd. He's not an easy man to miss. Broad shoulders and all. He was conversing with a pretty lass. I knew to be Thelma Tasman's best friend, Eve Jordan. Rex saved me the trouble of wading through the mob. Oh, it looks like quite a blowout, Bishop. What's the occasion? Shouldn't need a reason for a party, should we? No, but something tells me you have one. When are you coming by to see those photographs? You mean your syndicated coverage of the Joanna Martin murder? You expressed an interest in seeing them, remember? Yes, yes. <laughs> Old news never dies, does it? I'll see those photographs, Willison. But for now, I suggest you relax and enjoy yourself. White night number two. Present and accounted for. One more to go. The lady's husband, Victor Tasman. In the meantime... At a small table in the corner of the room, a man sat with a drink in front of him. He just sat there, fiddling with his tie and looking at the people. The lighting around him was dim. He was almost in shadow. No one paid him any notice. At straight up midnight, Detective Inspector Freddy Frisnay walked in and sent his plainclothes cronies to mingle among the crowd. Gullible but prompt. That's Freddy. I led him straight to the small table in the dark corner. I think it's about time you two gentlemen met. Hello, Spade. We've been looking all over for you. Mm. Oh, no. Come along, Freddy. I'll get you that drink. Is that side? That's him, all right. I'll be damned if I know how you did it. Even a hunted man couldn't resist one of Hugo Bishop's parties. You can't just leave him here, you know. You can have your man at a price, Freddy. My price. All right, let's hear it. A couple of hours to the outside. You're sure of what you're doing? Spade's here, isn't he? And you have the place covered? All right, Hugo. You brought us this far. I have to give you that. We'll go along for a bit. I have uh, something else for you, too. Mm, some of Spade's sketches. You think this man could be here at the party, too, now? Bucket of beer to a triple thick shake says he is. I looked over at Thelma Tasman and was certain he had to be. The Queen's white knights were swarming round her, including a late arrival that I surmised was, at last, Victor Tasman. Darling, are you sure you're all right? Yes, Victor. I feel much better now that you're here. I tried to come up earlier on the afternoon train, planning to go back on Monday. But uh, business got frantic and I uh, had to hang on. Then I had a phone call from a Miss Gorringe about this party. I, I, I don't quite understand. But she said you would be here and that it was important that I come. According to Mrs. Bishop, it is. But I don't know any more about it than you do. That's the secret of a successful party. Keep your guests in suspense. Oh, Mr. Bishop, this is Victor Tasman. How do you do? Strong handshake, I like that. Uh, glad you could make it, Mr. Tasman. <laughs> I found your Miss Gorringe rather difficult to refuse. <laughs> yes, I find it that way myself. Um, Thelma, may I tear you away for a moment? Victor, would you mind? Of course not, dear. <laughs> Thelma, uh, there is something you should know. Mervyn Spade is here. Mervyn? It's quite all right. He won't bother you. In fact, I rather think he's enjoying the party. I just didn't want you to be startled into doing something rash if you saw him. But what if Good he... girl. Enjoy the party. So the board was set. All the pieces were in place. Victor Tasman, the final piece, had taken his place alongside the Queen. Freddy and his men were at the ready. I waited, keeping my eyes on the man sitting alone in the darkest corner of the room. One last preliminary, and then we could begin. I scanned the room, looking for one particular woman. Suddenly, I saw Rex Willison make a bolt to the door. Not going, Willison? No, I have to make a phone call. I wouldn't, if I were. It's urgent. I expect so, but you'll have to wait. Look, I know Spade's here. I've seen him. So have the police, and they're here, too, all over the place. We're all sitting on a tidy powder keg. 
You're going off half cocked. You send it off prematurely. But it's a big story. I can't ignore it. It's likely to be even a bigger one. You'll have an exclusive. Just hold on. For how long? Not long. Now, I shouldn't think. I spotted the woman I was looking for over where I'd seen her earlier at the bar. Ah, Mrs. Martin. Have you a good time? Oh, ripping. I'd like you to meet a friend of mine. You may know him. Me? No, someone here? Yes, I'm sure of it. Someone. My friend may not be that one. Uh, Shall we find out? She was a bit tipsy, but managed to take my arm. I led her over to where Mervyn Spate was seated. Well, where is he? Ever see this man before, Mrs. Martin? Did he ever come round looking for Joanna before she was murdered? I've never seen this bloke before in my life. Mrs. Martin's denial of ever having seen Mervyn Spate completed the preliminaries. Now it was time to proceed. God save the Queen. I suggested to Spate that he take a walk around the room with me. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Gory watching us with interest, and Freddy Frisnay keeping tabs on our every move. Spate's face remained expressionless as he made the rounds. Well, you've already met one of Scotland Yard's finest, and of course, my right-hand woman, Vera Goring. The young lady traveling behind us is Joanna Martin's sister-in-law. Ah, Mrs. Martin, uh, forgive the oversight on my part. This gentleman is Mervyn Spate. Oh, he ain't the one that was hanging round. Correct, my dear. Then he ain't the one who did in the winch. Correct again. Then who did? Uh, come along. We're sure to find out shortly. Lord and Lady Cummins, so very good to see you again. I'd like you to meet uh, Mervyn Spate. One of London's premier oral surgeons, uh, Dr. Westbourne. Dr. Mervyn Spates. Some of high society's most reputable people are here tonight, including the lovely lady seated right over here. Known throughout the fashion world as Gloria Del Rey, the three gentlemen seated beside her are Rex Willison, Maurice Gerald, and the lady's husband, I believe, Victor Tasman. Uh, what is the meaning of this? You shall see, Mr. Tasman. I, I resent this public display. Do you now, Mr. Gerald? That man is Mervyn Spate. Quiet, Mr. Wilson. And he's got a gun. Fetch him. He's the one. Fate, don't do it. Well, Mr. Gerald, he seems to be pointing the gun at you. He's the one she called the gent. We'll see to him for you, Spate. Please, put down that gun. I've drawn your picture over and over. Now I see you again after two long years. Spate, nobody move. This is my party and this is my guest. Now, Mr. Spate... Let me remind you about the trees. Remember, you couldn't see beyond them at the asylum. Oh, he's crazy. Somebody stop him. He has a point there, Mervyn. You are behaving like a crazy man. I suggest that you hand me the gun. I told you, Bishop. No promises. Well, then, you leave me no choice. I'll have to protect the real killer. Hugo, don't! Stand aside, Bishop! No promises, mate. Stand aside. Shoot now, and they'll put you away where you won't ever see the trees. Now, what's it going to be? Space. Oh, very sane decision. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Bishop. Don't thank me. Thank Mervyn Spate for sparing you. A second time. The next morning, Gory and I sat around my desk and listened to Maurice Gerald's taped confession. Freddy had sent it over. It, uh, it was three or four years ago, after an all-night party, I'd, I got involved with her, and then she started taking me for money. Uh, she made more and more demands. I, uh, I could see there was to be no end to it. Yep. The, there was my wife and and, and, and and the kids. Now, why should a woman like that be allowed to destroy a marriage? I mean, a, a man's whole life. So you killed her? Yes. Yes. I killed her. 
Well done, Hugo. Uh, yes, it was, wasn't it? The Queen is out of danger. For the time being, at least. I trust she'll marry Victor Tasman now. And Mervyn Spate is free at last. Yes. Free to create a forest full of trees. Bloody good show. And they owe it all to you, gory girl. Rubbish. Modesty, Lady Verisham. Pure modesty. Shall we continue our game now? I'll clear away this mess. Um, now, where were we? I believe it's your mood. Mr. Bishop, you're certain to give me a sound thrashing. I'm a ruddy fool to ever play chess with you. Hmm. That's curious. Well, what is it you find so bloody curious, gory girl? Check. Mate. Hmm. Good show. Bloody good show. That concludes this week's production of The Zero Hour. Adam Hall's Queen in Danger. Next week, we'll begin another exciting dramatization of a tale of mystery and suspense. We'll tell our story in five days, at the same time Monday through Friday. So on Monday, rest your eyes and listen here to The Zero Hour. This is The Zero Hour on Beautiful Radio. been listening to The Zero Hour, a presentation of the Mutual Broadcasting System in association with Hollywood Radio Theater, heard every weekday at this time. Rod Serling is your host. Zero Hour is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. The Hollywood Radio Theater theme was played by Ferranti and Teicher. Hugh Douglas speaking. Tune in Monday and once again, rest your eyes. And listen here to the Zero Hour. This is Mutual, your news and sports radio network.